What's up? You're here with Sal and Matt from My Darkest Days, and you're watching loudguitars.com. <laughs> Doing good. Doing really good. It's about, uh, I'd say, yeah, it might be ten days, but about uh, seven shows? six six or seven shows, I think. Wow. It's been going really good. Uh, to be on tour with bands like Bush and Nickelback and Seether um, is really surreal and really cool because we were big Bush fans, and uh, I've always been a Nickelback fan and a Seether fan, so it's cool to open up for bands that you uh, idolize. Oh, it was awesome. Um, very smart guy at lyrics. Um, very talented musician. Uh, great drummer. He's just all around awesome. Um, and like to be around somebody like that, you just learn so much and just take it in. And uh, you know, I'm I'm smarter and better at writing lyrics and songs now because of him. And now we get to see him live every night and see how Nickelback runs their organization. Uh, and it's it's pretty incredible. Like they're great businessmen, but they're amazing musicians. And uh, like what they give their fans every night is is incredible. Like the the show is absolutely insane. It's the coolest rock show I've seen. So for a new band to be able to see that every night, and it's pretty incredible. Um, he produced the first record. Um, the second one was produced by Joey Moe, and. Uh, uh, the first record he Chad had time to. Um, this record he just finished uh, doing here and now uh, for Nickelback. So it was kind of like, dude, I'm going on vacation. <laughs> I just finished a record. It's time for vacation time. Oh yeah, on the first record a lot. Um, on this record he just uh, came in once in a while and put in his two cents uh, when he wasn't in Mexico on the beach. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like on the on the first record, I think he co-wrote almost um, every song except for maybe one or two. Uh, he got uh, he got Zach involved. Him and Zach are friends. Uh, we wanted a kick-ass solo, so uh, we couldn't really think of anybody else but Zach Wild to to do it. Um, you know, uh, Slash. We thought of Slash, but uh, you know, Zach Wild is is killer and his style. Like when you when you hear Zach Wild play guitar, you instantly know that's Zach Wild. There isn't a lot of guitarists out there today that that can play a solo and you'll be like, you know, you don't know who it is. It's almost like his voice. Uh, he has his trademark sound. We had so many features on the song too. Like we had Ludacris and Chad and we just wanted to make it like have somebody from every genre pretty much collaborate on that song. It turned out pretty cool. Uh, actually, Randy Rhodes was originally... Um, but through Randy Rhodes, obviously, you know, I followed all the other Aussie guitar players, um, Jake Ely and, and obviously Zach. Um, definitely, he was definitely one of them for sure. I, I was really more into like the Jimmy Pages and, and the Slashes and the Dave Navarros, those type of players. But uh, when I started to, to get into like metal licks, that's definitely when I started to kind of go towards people like Zach Wilde. Absolutely. He's really, really, really good. Um, every time I saw like live videos of James Addiction, and uh, and even even when he played with the Chili Peppers, that's probably when I, I first got into like listening to him a lot because I was a huge fan of the Chili Peppers. But every time um, I listened to One Hot Minute, which was the Chili Peppers, um, you know, I think worst selling record, I just thought the guitar work on it was super creative and cool. And uh, it got me listening to some of his solo stuff, and I just thought he was just really cool. He reminded me a lot of like players like Jimmy Page, but like kind of a little bit new age, kind of that sloppy cool, um, with just cool vibe. Uh, 
Um, well, we both were huge Kurt Cobain fans and, and, and Nirvana fans. Like, I think anybody that's around our age that, who grew up in the 90s, uh, like, he, he was like the John Lennon pretty much of our time, really. Um, yeah, he, he just brought, you know, the, the verse, pre-chorus, chorus back in, the, the, the formula that the Beatles set forward, you know, set forth for, for writing songs. And I don't think that was happening for a while. It was just like a, a you know, a lot of hair metal bands. And yeah. to be able to take that hair metal kind of aspect and, and the grunge aspect and put it into uh, a, a new type of music is kind of what we do. It's, it's just a, a mixture of all the the music that's been set forth before us. And I thought, I think he's a really underrated guitar player as well too, because he's always just looked at as just like a songwriter front man, but uh, I, I thought he was extremely creative, like all the, like the sounds, his tones on records, um, just the way he played notes, I, I thought he was great. Less wank, more melody. Yeah, totally, absolutely, very creative. Everyone collaborates, throws in ideas, and kind of whatever sticks, sticks. Um, so we would take songs uh, depending on how good they were or not. Uh, we collaborated with other writers. Um, yeah, it was, it was kind of all over the place. James Michael from 6AM uh, co-wrote two songs on the album. And uh, actually, Casual Sex has John Five playing guitar. Uh, we sent it over to John Five, and he ripped some uh, melodies and stuff. But what we do is... Uh, like Sal would be in Toronto and I'd be out west and we'd have the song kind of, you know, sussed out and then we'd send it over to him and then he'd lay down some guitar parts and then send it back. Nowadays, it's just so much different recording a record. You can do that kind of stuff. Yeah, like, uh, you know, it's it doesn't take a lot anymore to record records. Like, you could do it on, you could do it on your uh, uh, iMac if you wanted to, but... Uh, you know, you can do that just like Skype and, uh, hey, dude, we need a solo here. And then you get it back, and then our producer would be like, oh, let's try here a little bit more. And yeah. It'd be funny because, like, like, if Matt was in Vancouver and, and Joey, our producer, was in Vancouver, like, we'd be on Skype, be like, okay, I need you to lay down, like, a guitar solo over here. We'd do it, and literally, like, you're in real time, and you can hear, like, playing, I can hear them talking. And we could just literally, it's like we're in the same room recording parts. It's actually, it's insane, like, when you think about how you can actually do that. Now. Well, and then, then we could move on from that, and he could, he could sit and, uh, and noodle away and, and would come up with the parts while we moved on to another, another thing. It was all digital. Um, I use, uh, uh, when I'm at home, I'm using mostly the 11 rack stuff. Then I would fly it over to, to Joey, and Joey would use Amp Farm and all those kind of uh, digital uh, amps. But I would always start everything in 11, because it was really what I was comfortable with. But like, no amps, uh, no mics, nothing. It was all digital. And what's kind of crazy about that is it sounds more real than, like closer to like what I would want live than what I would be able to get with just like a microphone and an amp. Sure. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Like iPads, you plug into an iPad with an app and play through an iPad, and it sounds awesome. Yeah. Like it, it s like stands up to the mess of cab, you know. Feedback and all, it's just like, it's a, it's crazy how that actually, it, how great it sounds. Uh, well, pretty much what we did, like you're talking about the recording process, or just like. Well, we, um, Doug, you want to you wanna talk about your drums real quick here? He's, he's probably the, the best person to, to jump in, jump in. He's, he, he would best describe the, the drum process here. Hi, I play drums. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Actually, what, what we did is we actually mic'd up the, the, like, the real kit in the studio, but we'd also drop triggers on top so that like I can play everything in, and then once it goes in, you can just go in and put your different plugins and, and all that kind of crap on it. So really, there's still live drummer, live feel, but then it all goes back into digital as well. So, But yep, basically, and my bass player. Yeah. I play drums. Yeah, that's Dougie, and Dougie plays drums.
more more flamenco. I did like a little bit of jazz in university, but it like I it wasn't huge. Uh, it it didn't connect with me as much as as Spanish music did for sure. I I, I love like writing Spanish music. Um, I would definitely love to do something like that one day. Absolutely, just completely for no reason but for myself, really, just, just because I, I, I really connected with uh, flamenco music when I started to learn it. Um, I would never call myself like a flamenco guitarist by any means. Um, after seeing people like Paco de Lucia and like I learned from a guy named Roger Scanura who is this like incredible flamenco player. But I definitely will pull licks from whatever I learned at the time I was studying it for sure. Um, I would definitely love to do something like that just for myself, really, because I don't know, I really connected with that style of music. Yeah, we did. Uh, we wrote a lot on the road. Um, not a whole bunch of the stuff we wrote on the, on the road made this current record, but we did one song um, called Love Crime that we had written in a Walmart parking lot. Uh, I can't remember where we were, but uh, literally, like we, we wrote it in that parking lot, and it hasn't changed too much since that original recording um, in terms of the melodies and the riffs. Um, and it was really cool to kind of see that go from literally like a Walmart parking lot to, to the record. So, yeah, we tried you. Uh, mm -hmm. Just Pro Tools, or uh, some of us have GarageBand. You know, it, it's usually like what I write when I'm inspired by something or pissed off about something or. Yeah, uh, well, for, for both of us, we, we both have uh, a few family members who have, uh, have been diagnosed uh, with cancer. Um, some were survivors, some weren't. Um, my uncle passed away uh, when I was maybe 16 years old. And uh, I just watched um, like a six foot one strong, you know, mid 40 year old man um, wither down to like 90 pounds. And I watched him die and it was devastating to me. And uh, I just thought after that moment that, you know, nobody should die for this disease. It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and then a few years later, my grandmother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she's a survivor. And um, she got completely lucky just because there was a lot of awareness. And she got rid of it. And I thought, you know what? Let's bring some more awareness to, to cancer. And hopefully we can raise some money. So what we decided to do was I sponsor Kramer and Gibson Guitars. Um, I called them up and I was like, listen, I have this idea for a pink guitar. I really like this organization called Rethink Breast Cancer. Can we make a guitar? I'll play it the whole tour, and at the end of the tour, we'll get Nickel Back Bush, Seether, ourselves to sign it. We'll auction it off, and all the money we make from the auction will go to uh, breast cancer research. They were both down, so we made this custom-made pink fee. And it's, it's an incredible playing guitar. Um, I'm going to be sad to see it go because it's actually one of my favorite guitars right now. But it'll definitely go to a good cause. So going on about the cancer research, um, do you want to talk about the James one a little bit? Um, yeah, like um, my nephew was diagnosed with uh, neuroblastoma, which is uh, a cancer. And uh, we have a James fund uh, run every year and uh, raise, raise funds to, to look into neuroblastoma and how to cure it. You know, I think uh, the worst kind of cancer is, is for the kids and, you know, sick kids. Uh, they ha you know, kids don't have a chance to, to do anything and to, to be diagnosed at, you know, three, four, five years old with cancer is just horrible. So we like to support sick kids and uh, the James Fund and neuroblastoma research. Yep, that was a long while ago. It never really felt uh, right to be at the center of the stage for me singing uh, and, and playing guitar. Um, when I grew up listening to music, um, when I would watch bands, I would always, you know, for example, first time I got Guns N' Roses VHS tape that I got from my sister, um, I was never watching Axl Rose, I was always watching Slash, that's just what I connected to. Um, you know, I'd get like a Motley Crue tape, you know, when I was a kid and look at Mick Mars. It was just always what I connected to, but uh, for whatever reason, every time I started playing with other players, I was kind of the only one who would end up singing, so I'd always get pushed into that role. And when I met these guys, um, they were looking for a person to pretty much fulfill, uh, you know, the guitar playing harmony role, and uh, 
I started playing with them, and I just felt way more connected to that position um, and kind of felt way more at home. I think uh, Sal's band opened up for My Darkest Days uh, at a show, and uh, yeah, we just, uh, you know, I saw saw some great talent, and was like, hey dude, you want to come play in our band? And I was like, absolutely, because I don't want to be lead singer anymore, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that, I just want to do my thing. Well, in Sal's band wasn't, like, uh, when, we, uh, when we moved up to Toronto, uh, we took it really seriously jammed every day, put put a lot of hours into into music and like, you know, everything else was on the back burner. Like, you know, girlfriends, like jobs, you know, we didn't really have, we didn't take anything else except for music seriously. And I think he was the same way. And uh, the rest of his band really wasn't. So he was more than willing to be in a band that, that spent that much time on music. That's all we, wa we wanted to do, and, it, and I think that's part of the battle of trying to make it in a band, is finding those people that will literally um, give up everything to, to make it, because you really have to. Yeah. We're either going to be doing a, a headline run. Um, last year, we were on the Jägermeister tour, opening opening up for Buck Cherry and Papa Roach, and we got an offer to headline it this year. So at some point, we'll be doing that. But if that's not right after this tour, I mean, your brother's band's finishing their record, Three Days Grace. Uh, so who knows? We might be on tour with them. Also, it'll probably be festival season. Um, we will definitely be on tour supporting Sick and Twisted Affair, our new record, though. So. We're not sure exactly which two are yet, though. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.